Okay, um, I welcome the opportunity to focus on geogra geography and geographical knowledge because I share your concerns about what the current or recent um, cultural and political context has meant for what's happening to geography in geography lessons and um, the emphasis on skills rather than what children learn. Um, and um, I've, I've been reading your book and your articles. I found them very interesting, very challenging and quite provocative. And um, I'm going to concentrate on three aspects which I, have made me think a lot. One was the relationship in geography between everyday and theoretical knowledge. One about powerful knowledge and what geographical knowledge is powerful if it is and also what you've written about the relationship between knowledge and pedagogy. Um, well, before that, I was going to say, I come from a, I'm approaching this from a different perspective, and you might think um, I'm obviously a geography educator. I've kept in touch with what's been happening in geography education, and I've also been concerned my whole career with classroom practice, um, at both as a teacher in state schools, as a teacher educator, and my research has been focused on classroom practice. So when I read your book, when I read any book on education, I'm thinking of 12, 13 secondary school children in classrooms that I see and relating it to them. So I think as a practitioner. And you may think um, you're going to meet a, a geography educator, but in my early career, by chance, I had the most extraordinary group of people I worked with. In my first school, I worked with Douglas Barnes, who wrote Language Learn in the School Curriculum, got me involved in the Language Across the Curriculum movement, London Association of Teachers of English, where in the 60s, we all as a group read Thought and Language by Vygotsky and got, uh, discussed um, his ideas on everyday uh, learning and theoretical learning. My second school was Countersort College, probably one of the most progressive child-centred schools in the country, in Leicestershire. And there I had the privilege, again, of working with Pat Darcy, who wrote Making, an English teacher, Making Sense, Shaping Meaning, and Michael Armstrong, who wrote Closely Observed Children. And they introduced me to the writing of Jerome Bruner, and I've kept in touch with these people, and um, they continue to inspire me. The last book there, Exploring Talk in School, was dedicated to and says it's inspired by the work of Douglas Barnes. The whole book was inspired by his work. I have been inspired throughout my career by these teachers, um, and they really influenced me, because first of all, they all had a keen interest and focus on the intellectual development of students. And they were interested in what students learned, but they were also interested in learning about learning, and they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, Pat Darcy led a project in Wiltshire, learning about learning, but she was also intensely interested in what they learned. They were all concerned that school knowledge should not be inert, but should actually have meaning, real meaning, make sense. And they, um, all, all their ideas were underpinned by a social constructivist theory of learning. So um, a lot of my ideas have come from them as much as from being a geographer and a geography educator. So the first thing, uh, theme I'd like to look at is everyday knowledge. And um, I've been rereading Vygotsky and I'd just like to pick out three ideas from him. The first one, was that he distinguished between what he called, well, I don't know what he called them because I don't read Russian, but the translation is spontaneous concepts, which is what children form automatically without being aware of them, and scientific concepts, which you could call school or theoretical concepts. And he distinguished between them, he said, partly for reasons of research, to clarify in his mind, for academic reasons. And you can see there that the, it's a diagram someone else has produced, that those relate to each other and meet. So that in order to develop 
the scientific concepts, the school's concepts, they did need to relate, and you mentioned this, to the spontaneous concepts. And he said, we believe the two processes are um, related and constantly influence each other. And somebody wrote about that, is that both need to continue to develop through schooling. It's not just about developing the school concepts, but school has a responsibility for developing the everyday concepts. And the other thing that I've, I've picked out um, for this talk is that he recognised the strengths of both types of concepts. Um, the school concepts took children into beyond their experience to think in a more generalised way, but he described the everyday concepts as saturated with experience. And he said, on the other hand, an alohi, that's what he wrote, can correctly answer questions about slavery, exploitation or civil war. These concepts are schematic and lack the rich content. So he's talking about everyday concepts as being very rich. And the school concepts are only filled in gradually. Now, I'd like to relate this to geography now. All children from the youngest age develop their own personal geographies and their own imagination, probably more than any other subject. They have a lot of everyday concepts. So I don't know how bright it is. You can see this. So they shop. They see a whole variety of foods. They live in the housing areas. They get to know different areas of housing. They get to know public spaces. And they just hang about. And these are my, I know from my own grandchildren who are in these pictures that from the earliest age, they go to public parks and get to know, develop personal geography very young. They go to beaches, they experience weather, they experience the countryside. There is an enormous richness of experience on which geography can draw. But it's not only that, geography... That those personal experiences, those everyday narratives, are also part of the data that some geographers, academic geographers, use. It's not just something that's different and they do it. So people write about children's geographies and they study the everyday experiences of children. They write about youth geographies of youth cultures in cool places. Um, there was a big project at the British Library on uh, food stories. Um, P Professor Peter Jackson was involved in that. They study the everyday individual stories of food. Um, they also, as well as having their experiences, their everyday geography and personal um, geographical imaginations are made up of what they encounter in the media. It's not just what they do. So they might see tourist brochures. And um, Doreen Massey said, from tourist brochures to news to travel programmes, they all contribute to the formation of geographical imaginations. So what children bring to school is incredibly rich. And um, some academic geographers in universities recognise that this is important in university courses. And uh, one book on human introducing human geography says this to the people who read it. Start with your own experiences and then work outwards from that. Be aware of the human ge geographies wrapped up and represented by the food you eat, the news you read, the films you watch, the music you listen to, the television you gaze at. Be aware of the places you live in or travel to or see images of. Be aware of the person you are, the company you keep, the society you live in, the nature of your and others' living. And in your being aware, take note of what or what is being omitted, marginalised or others. Think about what you read in books and articles, how it connects or doesn't to your everyday life, and if so, why? And I'm going to argue the opposite from what you say in your, wait a minute, it's all stuck. <laughs> Thank you. I think you argue that the curriculum does not, should not take account of these, and it's the teacher, I think you said the teacher has to do. I think that if 
everyday knowledge is important in geography, I think it is in all other subjects, it needs to be made an object of study in the same way as the academic geography. And another Jerome Bruner's book written in the 90s says, and I agree, that all teaching should help children grasp the distinction between their personal knowledge on the one side and what's taken to be known by the culture on the other. But I think to do that, it needs to be actually in the curriculum as an object of study, the children's own personal experiences. And I don't think it's enough just to leave it to the teacher. The photographs at the bottom were taken in a school in Sheffield where we used to start our PGC course, interviewing where each uh, PGC student had to interview one or two students to find out what their personal geographies were. And um, the school was 95% minority ethnic groups. Um, and they found out what that student's experience of Sheffield, of Britain, and the world was. They had incredibly rich, saturated with experience. And the, the ki kids didn't want the lesson to finish. They had an opportunity to talk about Pakistan, Somalia, all the places that they, a lot of them have visited or their parents have been in. What we discovered that apart from that lesson, those students had no opportunity whatsoever to do it. It tends to be neglected if it's not there built into the curriculum. So I'm arguing that the, the everyday knowledge should be an object of study in the curriculum. And this has happened in some projects. For example, the GCSE pilot of the OCR used to include, in, in every topic, started off with the student's own experience. So on place, what constitutes your place? How is it represented, seen, and experienced by other? That was um, a March 2012 version. Um, the new version has changed that. That's removed. And it's replaced what types of settlement are there and what are the distinctive features of urban and rural environments. I would suggest that if, if, if you think you can leave it to the teacher, leaving it to the teacher that personal geography will not be included. On the OCR website, there is some support materials for this new curriculum, and there's a lesson plan to introduce what types of settlement. And the lesson plan suggests, as the activity, define different types of settlement, playing keyword bingo. Include conurbation, megacity, metropolis, capital city, city, town, village, and hamlet. Is that the new academic rigour playing? And, and that is, I'm, I'm just appalled that that is an example of a lesson plan in an OCR syllabus for 15 or 16 year olds that they learn by playing bingo, presumably memorise the definitions, and then that is, that, that's it. The children's ideas in science was uh, based on research done by the late Ros Drive at the University of Leeds. And um, it, then it developed into the, well, she, she did research on children's ideas in science, starting off with their ideas. And then it develop, developed into a project where that was built into the curriculum. Teachers had to elicit, first of all, students' conceptions and often misconceptions of science. So it can be done. I would argue that all the GA projects that are shown there <coughs> built into the proposal, building on and connecting with students' everyday knowledge. They all built that into the proposal. If you just say that you're going to build sustainable uh, communities and leave it to the teachers, my experience of watching secondary school lessons, I've been external examiner, I've visited hundreds of lessons, I think, and as a PGC tutor, it doesn't happen unless it's expected in the curriculum. There might be a, a quick two-minute question-answer session where you might find what personal knowledge person has and then go on to the lesson. The, in those projects, valuing places, making geography happen, personal geography was built in. So I'm arguing um, for it to be built in. And the reason why is that it'll be ne neglected otherwise, treated superficially, 
it helps them expand their everyday knowledge. It builds on it. It values what they already know. If they've got misconceptions, which a lot of them have from their everyday knowledge, it can deal with it. And it's a very rich source of data. I think you mentioned at one stage that, well, I mentioned that, and I think it's the next slide. Uh, another slide. I'll go on to that in a minute. Right, these are some of the things I picked up from your articles and books about the characteristics of disciplinary plowery knowledge. And I'm going to look at to see, I'm going to look at an example you gave of cities to see whether this applies to geography and the social sciences. And it's a debate you've uh, entered into in your book. Uh, is it objective? Is it the best knowledge to date, independent from specific sources? And um, one of the examples you give in an article, I think it was in a Pacific Journal, is of Auckland, where you said the students have their everyday knowledge, but a geography teacher would give them something different. Uh, about how they differ, their history, and how they change. I've no doubt that geography teachers will take them further than their everyday knowledge, but I think it's, geography's a bit more problematic than that. So, if geographers study cities as objects of study, how do they do it? Well, they might do it, um, and I still watch lessons on um, site and situation of a village uh, and the town and where it's done. I've usually seen it done where the students learning have no, not sufficient historical knowledge to understand the kind of context in which they're, they're interpreting it in present day terms. So that uh, isn't bounded by geography, that one needs history. Um, these models here, um, based on Chicago um, originally, have been described as um, having giving no notion whatsoever of the historical process and dynamics of society, and they don't give a realistic model of how the world works, and they restrict the nature of the questions you ask. This was trying to do, produce generalised knowledge about towns. And I'm just going to illustrate, there are now loads of geographies of urban areas. I'm just going to il illustrate it with four different approaches. The top map is one of Danny Dawling's maps. And his focus, he uses quantitative data, and his focus is on urban inequalities. And this is a map of London showing different life expectancies. I'd hoped he'd done one of Sheffield, which is more dramatic than London. There in, there's a... 10-year difference in life, average life expectancy in Brightside, David Blunkett's constituency, and Hallam, um, which is Nick Clegg's constituency. A 10-year difference. My neighbours happen to be GPs who have practices in both, and they've often talked about um, their different patients. Um, so he looked at it quantitatively. He was interested in um, inequalities... Um, and he, his explanations of it were in terms of social, political and economic issues and it raised to him matters of social justice. And that's one way of looking at cities. City Worlds is written by Doreen Massey and other people and she was interested in interrelationships within cities and without, how places are constructed from the way they have relationships with other places. It's a, a relational way of looking at uh, cities. And she applied it to her own place, Kilburn. Uh, these PowerPoint uh, slides here are from Michael Bradford's presentation at a GA conference. He was interested in change in a city, um, changing buildings, changing shapes, and he uh, focused on change in the context of neoliberalism. What does the present economic climate, how has that affected um, changes in Manchester? So one's focus on inequality, the other on interrelationship, that one on change. And geographies of young people is just an example of a lot of geographers focus on not the generalised geography of town, but how 
young people experienced, how women, ex Sally Bowlby's, how women experienced Reading. My Sheffield's very different from a young person's Sheffield. Um, my daughter's partner is Afro-Caribbean and his um, experience of Sheffield is very different from many others. <laughs> so I think that one looks at different, uh, how people are included, excluded, how they experience. These are four different ways of looking at cities. So now I began to think of what is the knowledge that you acquire from that, or you would want students to acquire from it. You don't want them to know, to be able to reproduce that map. Or, or to know the facts and figures about Sheffield. You don't want them to know about and reproduce ideas about Kilburn. You don't want them to be able... The knowledge isn't knowledge of Manchester, and it isn't knowledge of females in Reading. It's much more an approach, a way of thinking, a way of investigating towns, which seems... And the concepts associated with that. Um, and... Which one's better? How do we decide? Because I think there are lots of powerful ways of looking at cities. And I don't think the idea of powerful knowledge tells you which one's better. I think you then have to argue which is more worthwhile, whether it's more worthwhile to look at Burgess's models or use um, Doreen Massey's interrelationship way of looking at cities. Um, Liz Taylor did some very interesting work where she collected... Um, ideas from urban geographers on what they thought should be what they studied and came up with this diagram which I think is reproduced in Urgy of um, the political dimension and a whole range of approaches. Well, what struck me is in relation to the idea of geography being bounded is that you can't understand urban geography even if you're focusing on the geography, without understanding a bit about politics, about economics, about history. Right, we'll rush through. But, hang on, everything so far has been about cities as if they're the same all around the world, but they're not. That's Singapore, that's Malacca, that's Umtata. And most work on cities has been very positioned it's been uh, seen as, um, it's been studied from a Western point of view and doesn't necessarily apply. And can we generalise about it all? Um, Dave, in the Third World Cities, he starts by saying, can we even talk about cities generally? Because every, and he discusses Third World, um, they're all so different and we need to understand their history. There isn't a simple, easy geography knowledge about cities that the teacher can tell the students in Auckland or London or whatever. We have to make choices and we have to decide what's worthwhile. So, is it, is it of, of all those things in the list, I thought, is it the best knowledge to date? Don't know. The thing I thought it did do out of all these, I don't think it's objective, I don't think it's independent of its context of origin. I had a quote from that, um, that book there. It's human geography is not a direct, um, straightforward reality out there. It's a social construction and interpretations of the world differ from place to place. But it does, I think, provide new ways of thinking. So perhaps that's what's powerful about geographical ways of thinking rather than the products. So, very, very quickly, my research on um, curriculum and pedagogy, you suggest that they're two separate things. I think that what is taught is influenced by how it's taught. And my research looked at people, it was, happened to be the theme of settlement in three different schools for the first national curriculum. One taught it with a knowledge of terms. They probably played bingo. The second one, no, they didn't. Uh, the second one um, focused on changing patterns and functions. And the third, local villages. They used completely different ways of doing it. The first school, they probably could repeat that knowledge. 
The second one, they knew that knowledge could be gained and constructed from maps and photographs and could apply to another situation. And the third one, which huge questionnaires, I've got about a minute left, haven't I, to um, did it through interview. So I think if we're thinking of powerful knowledges, ways of understanding, powerful geography, we have to think of uh, what about powerful pedagogies. Without powerful pedagogy, there's no powerful knowledge. And I think the powerful pedagogies, for me, are um, geography through inquiry. That might or might not be the cover of a book that's coming out in September. An, an inquiry process, because it's questioning, it looks at data, and it uh, recognises that uh, knowledge is constructed. Dialogic teaching, which uses a lot of talk and debate, um, I think is very important. And I, I'm very interested in the ideas, in, as a geographer's book, Alistair Bonnet's How to Argue, which is different ways of thinking. And I think that that's where we need to focus. To make the knowledge powerful, we have to think of how geographers argue their case, how they substantiate their knowledge, and where it's not evidence like science, how it's substantiated um, through uh, consistency. And I think a criti critical pedagogy that recognises the political nature of most issues that we study in geography and asks questions and probes ethical issues. So I think I've got one more slide. Um, and I wouldn't call any knowledge uh, powerful. It's only potentially powerful. And I'm going to a music festival at the moment, which has got this quote in its programme, music doesn't excite until it's performed. Knowledge isn't powerful unless it actually means something in the students. And so I've left, to finally, I think, should, well, I've put this question, should the curriculum include reference to everyday knowledge as an object of study? What kind of knowledge should students acquire? And how do we, because there's so much powerful knowledge in geography, how by what criteria would we decide what's worthwhile to teach? And should we think it more in terms of developing powerful ways of understanding? And what kind of pedagogy is required to do, to do this? And those are questions I think we need to consider. Okay. <laughs>